Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program. My guest in the studio is someone familiar to us, but now has a different title. Joining me in the studio today is Armenia's High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs, Zare Sinanyan. We'll be chatting with him after the break. Welcome back, everyone. Joining me today is Armenia's High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs, Zare Sinanyan. Welcome back. Thank you, and good evening. Good to be back. How, how's it going? How, how, tell me about what's the, what the last three or four months have been for you. Uh, the last three or four months have been uh, very busy with both organizational work and um, in terms of figuring out policies that we're going to proceed and policies that we're going to pursue um, as uh, the Office of uh, the High Commissioner of Diaspora and Affairs. Uh, you know, those th beginning two and a half, three months of, of the four months were also coincided with the tourist season in Yerevan, where a lot of the diasporans were actually physically present in Armenia. And therefore, uh, even in that sense, uh, there was increased activity. In terms of meeting with our uh, various diasporan representatives you know, from all over the world. But most importantly, we were um, settling in, making the transition from a ministry to um, office of the prime minister status, and uh, working on issues such as staffing, such as uh, division of work, figuring out the structure of the office, as well as actually physically visiting various diasporan communities throughout the world. Uh, I, I know that uh, one of your first stops was Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little about that community, uh, what is anticipated, uh, and then it also leads into my uh, future question about the diaspora itself. Sure. So indeed, my first visit uh, was to Russia and specifically to Moscow, um, a city that is home, I should, shouldn't say just city, but a uh, region, the Moscow region is home to approximately a million Armenians, uh, much like the city of Los Angeles as it is composed of approximately 89 various municipalities spread over a reasonably large geographic area. So is Moscow composed of multiple uh, cities spread out around Moscow and Armenians are spread out throughout those cities. Um, the community there is very deep, it's very sophisticated and complicated. It has uh, all the layers, uh, social and um, economic, that you may imagine uh, a, co a community would have of that size. Also, the uh, Moscow community is composed of Armenians that come from various places, not merely from Armenia, but also uh, Armenians that are long-time residents of the uh, Russian Federation, uh, before even Soviet Union, from the times of the Russia, uh, Russian uh, Empire, and uh, from Georgia, from what is now Azerbaijan, from Armenia, uh, and from other places. The uh, community has certain organizational structures, but they're not uh, organized in, in the sense that uh, we understand them. Um, there is one uh, large organization known as the Union of Armenians of Russia, also known as SAR, Soyuz Armen Rasi, which has uh, local district offices throughout the, the Russian Federation. But other than that, in Moscow, you have everything from um, economic organizations, cultural organizations, the embassy is very active. Uh, what's specific about Moscow is that uh, you have individuals that are engaged in every sphere of Russian life, from entertainment and, and movie making to the most sophisticated and complicated sciences. They're everywhere. Uh, and they're very well integrated in uh, Russian society, in the Russian economy. The key is figuring out a way to most optimally use the potential that the community represents 
and uh, to make sure that whatever negative processes that are happening in the Russian community, such as you know, uh, dilution uh, and assimilation, so that those processes are slowed down to the extent possible. So last month's visit by the Prime Minister really signaled that this administration, unlike the previous regimes, uh, has a, a, a sort of a working policy vis-à-vis uh, -vis the diaspora. Mm -hmm. Uh, my initial question is, was there anything from the ministry that could have been used or did you have to start from the scratch? Uh, I would say that the only thing that was salvaged from the ministry, the only substantive thing that was salvaged from the ministry was the program Aritun, which was last year before me renamed to Kyle Debitun. In essence, it's the same program, although the format has been changed somewhat. It, it was a good program and it's even better now and it's going to be even better in the following years. But other than that, in terms of work um, with communities, in terms of uh, good faith that was created, in terms of uh, trust, in terms of policies that were developed, we have to start from scratch. Of course, there's a certain base, you know, certain staff members that know people in certain communities that have interacted with them and understand those communities somewhat, but on a systemic basis, on a sort of a uh, rational basis with the, with the end goal of knowing how to work with communities, that work hasn't been done. So we're starting from scratch. Uh, you're starting for, from scratch in 2019. There has been 28 years ahead of that yes. as far as the uh, independent Armenia and its relations with the diaspora. One thing that strikes me that in the 28 years there has been um, a divide uh, cultural, social, and understanding on both ends. Sure. Uh, we here in the diaspora have grown up with a certain set of uh, stereotypes vision and whatnot uh, regarding an Armenia, mm -hmm. have not fully understood the so called Soviet system mm -hmm. that uh, we were operating. Uh, you know, uh, at the same time in the diaspora and at the same time the people growing up in Armenia, including the current generation, the independent generation, do not understand fully what the diaspora is. What are some of the steps that your office will be taking in order to acclimate the average Armenian uh, about what is the diaspora? It is a very political concept. Mm -hmm in and of itself. And I think that lack has impeded, as well as the previous regimes basically not caring about uh, anything, has impeded the growth and the harmonization of these two. And that is absolutely the case. Indeed, the relationship between uh, Armenia and diaspora has all this time not been a healthy one. It, not, it hasn't been based on um, really sincerity and, and the willingness to accept one another and improve one another. And that's what we're trying to change. I think the best way to really understand each other is to come in contact with, with one another. That's happening on a couple of levels. Uh, first, of course, is the increased tourism that's taking place. Uh, you know, you're not going to shock anyone uh, in Armenia by saying that you're a diasporan. You know, diasporans are all over the country nowadays. They're frequent visitors. The country's literally flooded with visitors from the diaspora. Of course, the, the, the huge increase that has taken place, especially in the last two years, is not uh, nearly the level at which we want to be, but it's a, it's, it's a great start. Uh, so people coming in contact with each other, interacting, getting to know each other, spending time together. Of course, people-to-people -people contact is most important. Secondly is the, in my, in the migration that's taking place, and this is the positive migration, folks coming into Armenia and, and moving there and living there. We had a very curious uh, study case kind of a situation, and, which has yielded, I think, good results. Is, and I'm referring specifically to the Syrian Armenians who moved to Armenia as a result of the Syrian, Syrian civil war. Of course, the unfortunate part of it is that many, many of them left Armenia. They came, they received Armenian passports, and then received refugee statuses in Canada, Sweden, in Australia, and moved on. That's unfortunate, and Armenia has to uh, 
carry its share of the blame for that because it didn't create the preconditions for folks to remain there. But the positive aspect is that a large number did remain in Armenia. We're talking about somewhere between 10 and 13,000 individuals. And those 10 and 13,000 individuals are now quite well settled. They feel at home. They think of themselves as, you know, Suriahais, but also Hayastansis. And they have caused a minor cultural change in Armenia. That small number has actually caused the change. And that change is most visible in the culinary mm -hmm. culture and also in the service culture. Yeah. So service in Yerevan, in the, hotel, in the restaurants, is not what it used to be seven, eight years ago before the influx of the uh, Syrian Armenians. Yeah. So even that small presence, a relatively small number of diasporans, have brought a qualitative cultural improvement in Armenia. And now, fortunately, after the revolution, uh, there is increased migration of um, highly skilled professionals, so individuals who are coming to Armenia not waiting for the government to present its social programs that it needs to unveil in order to encourage mass uh, repatriation. Folks who are self-sufficient, they come in, they'll either open businesses and actually create jobs for others, or because of their skill set, they are not anticipating having any problems securing mm -hmm. jobs for themselves. These people coming in are also uh, creating that permanent presence and therefore influencing the cultural change within Armenia. Um, after the break, I want to uh, talk about Syria some more and especially what's going on right now. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back, everyone. If you are just joining us, my guest today is Armenia's High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs, Zare Sinanyan. Welcome back, Zare. Uh, right before the break, we were talking about the positive impact that uh, the earlier Syrian migration, Syrian-Armenian migration had, has had in Armenia, and it is quite noticeable. Mm -hmm. I have traveled there, and I've seen that they've had a positive effect, not only with the establishments that they have started, but also kind of it spilled over to uh, the locals. Unfortunately, we're living in a situation right now with the Turkish invasion of northern Syria that our population, our uh, people there were once again under attack, once again by Turkey and are forced to flee. If there is another wave of migration in Armenia, what are some of the things that your office is doing and will Armenia be able to absorb an additional number of new, right. uh, uh, I don't want to call them refugees, but new uh, repatriates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, of course Armenia has gained a certain amount of experience due to the earlier influx of Syrian Armenian uh, compatriots. Uh, that if experience is here, some of the structures are still there and working, although um, a lot of the Syrian Armenians are well settled and they don't really uh, benefit from a refugee status per se, mm -hmm. but uh, for example, the health services that were provided to them uh, free of charge are still continuing. Uh, our office, I have the responsibility of being the mediator between an applicant and the Armenian health ministry in order for certain individuals to get free surgeries that go beyond whatever the social packages that the government provides all Armenian citizens. That's just as an example. So some structures are already there and due to the experience uh, will benefit any new influx of such refugees. Also, things have changed on the ground. We have a new government that is dedicated to a new way of doing things and one of those things is uh, a deliberate policy of increasing Armenia's population and a large portion of that policy is promoting repatriation. So if, God forbid, our, our people are forced to flee and they choose to come to the Republic of Armenia, uh, I believe the government will be much better prepared and much more willing and much more uh, on an ideological basis ready to absorb that population. When things got really bad at Tel Abyad and uh, about uh, around Derek, uh, Al-Malakia, and 
it seemed like Kamishli may be threatened as well. I assure you that we were on war footing. Every jurisdiction that would have any involvement with uh, accepting these uh, individuals or even having to deal with them in Syria was working around the clock and getting ready for the worst. Fortunately, the worst has not happened and everyone's on um, kind of expectation mode right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and on top of it, a new group of uh, experts and uh, relief assistance as part of the earlier mm -hmm. uh, group went back to uh, Aleppo and is continuing that work. Uh, that and we also have a military humanitarian mm -hmm. presence That's, in Syria. Yeah. You know, we, were, we took a lot of criticism from the United States for sending that uh, humanitarian contingent, but it was a matter of principle for the Republic of Armenia to have a military presence, albeit peaceful, because, you know, boots on the ground is boots on the ground. And God forbid we have to act. Uh, it's good to know that there are 80 uh, Armenian individuals wearing military uniforms there to be useful, but fortunately it hasn't come to that. But it does go give us a sense of comfort. That's good. We're going to take a short break and we'll come back and talk about some youth uh, programs that maybe Armenia can benefit from and you, maybe you have in your office that our youth can benefit from. Please uh, join us. We'll be right back. <music> Welcome back, everyone. I'm continuing my conversation with Zaria Sinanyan, Armenia's uh, High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs. Uh, one of the key uh, messages, so to speak, that Prime Minister Pashinyan had in his visit last month in Los Angeles was welcoming young people back to Armenia. It's this repatriation uh, component. Obviously, there are a lot of uh, logistical uh, aspects, but what are some of your headlines as mm -hmm. far as what your office is working on to uh, ensure that when these youth come, they, they become acclimated? I have to pause and say that I'm from the uh, generation of diaspora Armenians that we would dream about going to Armenia and now there's a generation, the children of my contemporaries who finish college, finish high school and all they want to do is go to Hayastan and do something there. Right. Uh, what are some of the programs or how can you, your office facilitate that? So we have um, the Auditun program which I already talked about, there's no need to elaborate on that. We have the youth, uh, young leaders uh, program, which is a kind of a, um, a graduate degree of the Kail Debitum program, and that's very successful. And this year, uh, from the, this year's program, two uh, young ladies have already repatriated, um, and the others went back really tearfully. <laughs> uh, very sorry uh, not to be able to remain in Armenia, but the seeds have been planted. Uh, on top of that, of course, we started immediately after um, assuming office, we started our uh, internship program for young diasporans at the office of the High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs. And we've cycled through several individuals already, um, both from Russia and from US and Canada and um, also Lebanon. And we currently have another Canadian and another uh, Russian Armenian uh, doing their internship there. But these are only small measures. These are sort of pilot programs. We intend to expand the internship program. We intend to start hiring from the diaspora. We've interviewed several individuals and have um, preliminarily reached an agreement about hiring them. We do face certain obstacles in the form of uh, the civil service law, which is an abomination. It's a horrible law that uh, basically precludes any diaspora from working in the Armenian government because it uh, requires a certain test to be taken which uh, unless you're a native Armenian speaker and have been educated in Armenia you'll be unable to pass so that law will be dealt with I assure you because it, it, it can't be otherwise um, also we are about to announce another program that brings in 
20 young diaspora professionals and spreads them throughout the other ministries. We're in the process of negotiating with the other ministries to be, uh, to figure out how they're going to place them. Um, on the ground, we also deal with some uh, old way of thinking, which is, well, you know, if they're from the diaspora, then there are national security risks because they may be spies. I've heard uh, idiotic, uh, <laughs> frankly, really uh, feeble-minded arguments like that. And that's sort of a cultural thing that we need to deal with. Of course, I deal with it immediately when I hear something like that. But uh, there is that element. Anyone who says that is clearly anti-state-minded. They do not belong uh, working for the state because they, they can't possibly, obviously they don't understand our nation. They don't understand what Armenia represents. They clearly are not you know, state builders and, and they're a problem, but um, that's something else that we need to overcome. Overall, it's our, uh, with the reform or elimination of that uh, civil service law, our goal is to literally open all the doors for all the diasporans, especially young professionals, to come and work in Armenia. We need them badly. We need professionals. We need good managers. And without substantial diasporan involvement in Armenia, uh, we cannot achieve the type of success, the type of leap forward that we're counting on mm -hmm. in order to be able to, to be ready uh, for the challenges that are to come in the future. Uh, Armenian citizenship, it has become much simpler than, mm -hmm. you know, when it first uh, started where you probably you had to like cut a finger and give it to the government. Uh, is there talk about emulating the Israel model, uh, um, which is, you know, Jews anywhere can immediately right. become uh, citizens of Israel? So two different issues. One is the technical act of getting citizenship. The act is uh, relatively easy, however, still problematic because of certain bureaucratic um, in inflexibility, I want to call it. Uh, folks, especially from the Middle East, who, have, uh, who don't have birth certificates, the Institute of Birth Certificates doesn't exist in, the, in those countries. Uh, folks whose spelling in their church-issued baptism papers uh, the spelling doesn't coincide with their U.S. passport, their Canadian passport, or whatever cap passport they may be carrying, uh, are having difficulty getting citizenship because our uh, citizenship office, it's called OVIR, the, mm -hmm. it's a remnant from the Soviet days. The OVIR simply lacks the flexibility to deal with these issues. They are hung up on these birth certificates. They demand birth certificates from individuals, for example, Polsahais, who have left Istanbul haven't served in the army and will be subject to arrest if they go back after their certificates. Uh, another issue that I've heard is folks who receive their 10-year permanent residency uh, permit and then when they have to renew it, they force them to go through the same application process instead of automatically renewing mm. it. So there are these uh, problems that are endemic to the old way of thinking and just the bureaucracy just not being problem solvers and not being efficient and just not understanding what work is and how work is supposed to be conducted. Then there's the second issue. So th those issues need to be dealt with, right, on an institutional basis, on dealing with the way they're trained, I guess, dealing with the way they think and whatever problems, or problematic, dogmatic things there may be in the laws that need to be changed. Second aspect of it is the law on return. The Israeli law on return specifically states who is a Jew and therefore who is subject to this law. And then it lists a relatively brief bill of rights mm -hmm. that these are your rights if you come to Israel and you, you are a Jew. Mm -hmm. This is what the government is going to do for you. Right now, the National Assembly and specifically um, the chairman of the Parliamentary Commission the parliamentary committee that deals with diaspora and affairs, the former diaspora minister, Mikita Rapetian, has formed a working group along with us and several other jurisdictions uh, whereby we're going to take that law. We have taken that law. We've, we've drafted um, a new bill based on the Israeli law. Um, we're tweaking it to correspond to our Armenian realities and going to push through the parliament the new law on return. 
uh, there is some disagreement as to what it should be called, repatriation, return. Folks are saying, well, repatriation means implies that people were from actually there. They're saying, some people are saying, Aravimataha'is may resent that and say, well, Aravimataha'istan is not Aravimataha'istan, so we're not repatriating, we're just patriating. In any case, we'll, we'll find the term semantics. that <laughs> it's truly is semantics. It's, uh, the substance is what matters. We are going to have a law that's going to set out who gets to benefit from this law. It's very important, and actually probably biggest bone of contention. Uh, who is Armenian? How do we define it? Um, and then what those folks are entitled to, those obligations that the state takes upon itself if a person decides to repatriate. Obviously those obligations revolve around uh, education, health care, and other fundamental rights that the government ought to provide all of its citizens, but especially those that are coming from another place and need time to adjust and need time to settle. I, it's my strong belief and I think it's universally recognized that in order not to create any resentments between the locals who are there and who may be in economic need and those that are coming in and will be benefiting from, from these economic packages, we'll have to match whatever we're doing mm -hmm. for them to those that are in Armenia and have those types of needs. The last thing we want is any kind of resentment between any group. We want love and harmony between the both. So um, all these things to think about, but we're working on it actively. Uh, one of the things that the popular movement, the Velvet Re Revolution kind of uh, brought uh, to the fore is the need for the systemic change that's hap that needs to happen, which you talked about the old way of thinking. Right. This is certainly something that uh, Armenians in Armenia and Armenians mm -hmm. in diaspora can do together because uh, of the you know vested interests that uh, that are there and it's it's really important for uh, things to move forward. For example, and I've said this here within our organizations that we need to uh, establish uh, within our schools at least a mm -hmm. uh, curriculum on Soviet Armenia outside of oh Baruch Sevak Zizernag Apert Tevail Nevail and that right. Uh, right. that are uh, there that is there a, uh, an effort or is there a way that we can institute you know, institutionalize uh, education about the diaspora as part of Armenian history within the uh, school system. This is something that definitely can be discussed with Arai Karuchunya, the education minister, but uh, don't you think it's time that we take Armenian history and make it uh, a, a collective of everything? Right. Well, I think, you know, if I understand your question correctly, in the broader sense, I believe we need to inculcate our children from, uh, from the very youth, from very young age, about who we are, what our realities are. We need to inculcate that love that we need to have towards each other because we are all that we have, mm -hmm. okay? I have you, you have me, and anyone else that's outside is not going to care about our nation, our culture, our language, our way of life, uh, and any more than us. That's just the reality that there is. We need, one needs to support the other and vice versa. You know, the goal of strengthening Armenia must be a universal goal for everyone, not because Armenia is, uh, not only because Armenia is paramount, because that's the only place we have left from our historic homeland, but also it's because it's the only guarantee for the diasporan uh, survival. The only way to prolong, at least to prolong the life of the diaspora and actually strengthen it, is to make Armenia a powerful state. That's the only way we can you know, keep our youth involved and engaged in the long term with Armenia and with their own culture and their heritage. So the, the same has to be said about, you know, if, if we want to uh, bring in hundreds of thousands of millions of people, which we do, you know, I, you know there's that vision 2050 mm -hmm. that is going to be unveiled sometime by the end of the year. If we want to bring in a million and a half, two million people over the next 25, 30 years, we need society in Armenia on a societal level to be ready and willing and anticipating um, hosts for the newcomers, uh, much like Israel has done for its newcomers. Mm -hmm. And probably teaching children here about 
Armenia uh, more so in, in a more in-depth way to really give them a realistic picture. It also helps them in the future to become uh, physical, but more importantly, psychological mm -hmm. repatriants. You know, yeah. I, I don't know if someone else has coined that term or has used that concept in in the past, but I, I use it. Uh, I, th I thought I did it, but I could be very wrong. Before you have physical repatriation, there has to be psychological yes. repatriation. Because if, you have, if you've repatriated psychologically, the physical repatriation is, is an act that will follow at the right time, under the right circumstances. But unless there is psychological repatriation, physical repatriation mm. will probably never happen. That also requires, uh, that also requires the open-mindedness that not necessarily our Western ways are always best, the best. applied in an Armenia uh, right. situation because their ways might be more, uh, you know, beneficial yep. in that, uh, you know, milieu. So of course. Because there's the diaspora and sometimes uh, uh, assessment is well we do it here this way of and course. it's the best well no it, there has to be that right. dialogue and, and communication uh, final thoughts before we wrap final up final thoughts you know I, I really uh, want our people to remain engaged with Armenia I want them to keep the enthusiasm for the, the Velvet Revolution alive have some patience the harm that was done to Armenia was so massive and the starting point is, is so low. The work that's involved is so much that I know people's expectations are, are very high, but in order for us to satisfy those high expectations, we must have the time, we have, must have the support, we must have the patience. Um, the government is working towards achieving those goals, but again, we need all the help that uh, there is. The help is not in the form of aid. No one is expecting aid anymore. We're done with that. We don't want aid. Folks who are providing aid will continue providing mm -hmm. aid. We don't need to convince them of that. But in terms of willingness to share their professional skills, their expertise, willingness to invest in Armenia, um, willingness to help with the judiciary uh, reforms, all of that is essential right now for Armenia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope we can count on that kind of uh, commitment from our compatriots. And together we can create that Armenia that's going to be the guarantor for the longevity of the diaspora. Um, and also, I think it's time for all of us to kind of realize that there is a lot of work ahead. And we of all course. have to uh, sort of, you know, roll up our sleeves and say, you know, this is it. This is our opportunity to, uh, it's not about the diaspora's longevity. It's to have a strong and viable homeland of course. because that is the heartbeat of the diaspora. At of the course, end of the it's just that having that <coughs> strong and powerful homeland serves everyone's purposes. Yes. If you think that your life in the diaspora is where you want to be and that's a normal state of being, by all means, the only way for you to secure that way of being is to help mm -hmm. uh, make Armenia powerful, have a strong homeland. Otherwise, Diaspora is a very fleeting concept. We have lost many diasporas mm -hmm. throughout the last mm -hmm. thousand years, mm -hmm. and we'll lose many more. But we won't if we make Armenia powerful. And, and you, you're right, there's a lot of work involved. I don't think that anything that I talked about doesn't have a multitude of impediments and uh, roadblocks on, uh, on the way. But that's what work is all about. That's why good things always take a lot of work. And it's also refreshing to have a member of the Armenian government actually understand the diaspora and talk about it, whereas before they didn't. Uh, thank you so much thank for you. Uh, thank being you for here. Having me. Zahra Sinanyan will be part of uh, the Armenia Diaspora panel on Saturday at the Armenian National Committee of America's Grassroots Conference. I will be moderating that panel, so he and I will continue this conversation. If you uh, have time, please come and participate at the Grassroots Conference. It's all day Saturday at the Pasadena Convention Center. It starts on Friday with a panel featuring women, Armenian women in journalism. Thank you again for Thank being you. here. Thank you for joining us. Have Thank a great day.